Air Officer Commanding in Chief of Indian Air Force. With a distinguished career spanning decades, Air Marshal Singh has played a pivotal role in shaping India's aerospace defense strategy and operations. His extensive experience in command and strategic planning offers invaluable insights into military aviation and defense challenges. We are honored to have his expertise guiding our panel discussion today. I would request him to please come on stage, please. A big round of applause for sir. Next, uh, I'm pleased to introduce Group Captain Abhijit Sarin, uh, who's a fighter pilot. He has worked on missiles and US. He has wealth of uh, experience in aerospace operations and defense strategy with his ex extensive background in managing critical missions and enhancing operation capabilities. Group Captain Sarin brings a unique perspective to our discussion. His expertise in aviation and strategic planning will provide invaluable insights. I request him to please uh, come on stage. N bigger round of applause for him. Next, I'm honored to introduce Group Captain Angel Rubin, uh, Commanding Officer of the Electronics Instrumentation Training Institute, Indian Air Force, with distinguished career in aerospace and extensive expertise in electronics instrumentation. Group Captain has been pivotal in advancing technical training and operational excellence. His insights into cutting edge technologies and their applications in defense operation will greatly en enrich our panel discussion. Please come on the stage, please. Big round of applause for him, sir. Next, I'm pleased to introduce Ms. Vandana Ayer, Assistant General Manager of Unmanned Systems at Bharat Electronics Limited. With her extensive experience in unmanned systems and defense technology, Ms. Ayer plays a crucial role in advancing innovation in this rapidly evolving field. Her deep knowledge of unmanned systems and their applications will offer valuable insights into current trends and challenges. I re request you to please come on stage, ma'am. And now I invite uh, Air Marshal Singh to please moderate from here, sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the criticality and the, of the UAS, its threats, uh, the the threats and the risks that go with it. I think I don't need to speak about it. All of us have been watching what is happening in the Ukraine war and also to a limited um, degree what's happening in the Middle East. <clears throat> All the, the UAS systems being used right now in the Ukraine war may not be of the high technology uh, requiring the kind of data links and AI and the connectivity that we are talking about, which is linked to cybersecurity, they're fairly uh, you know, rudimentary. But the impact on warfare of an unmanned system, I think is quite clear for all, all of us to see. And uh, that is why it is so important to understand what is the capability and how important UA systems will be in the future. In fact, in the next five to 10 years, we will not be able to imagine uh, air war or in fact, uh, all wars that will not primarily be led by and sustained by UAS, unmanned airborne systems or unmanned you know, systems. And therefore it becomes all the more important that uh, they be protected from cyber attacks, which will be the number one kind of attack in the future. And because UAS systems, apart from the autonomous ones, are heavily dependent on their uplinks and their downlinks because most of the information, the real-time information that they transmit uh, is heavily dependent on a downlink and they are also connected very intricately with a very vast network which includes all kinds of manned systems, uh, you know, sensors uh, on the ground and shooters in the air and on the ground. So losing a UAS is going to have a very critical effect on the entire war fighting capability uh, of that arm, whether it's the Air Force or the Army or the Navy. <clears throat> so to help us understand what the threats are, what the use cases are for UAS with regard to an air arm, uh, we will have the first speaker, uh, Group Captain Sareen will uh, you know, lead us through what the use cases are, how are they used, etc. 
Thereafter, what are the vulnerabilities and how threat modeling is done for UASIS and the entire system in which a UAS operates will be done uh, by Group Captain Robin. And of course, <clears throat> in the end, because of Make in India and Atma Nirbharta, India is now really taking a leap forward in uh, now designing and manufacturing UAS systems. So, uh, Mrs. Ayer from Bell will uh, discuss with us what are the issues concerned with the productionizing and designing of UAVs. So I'd like to now call the first speaker, uh, Group Captain Sareen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Group Captain Sareen. I've come here from Hyderabad. Uh, I've been always in operations till about a few months back. Uh, being at the tip of the sphere or in operations, I've had some insight. I've had experience of uh, commanding a UAS squadron, an operational UAS squadron, as well as a missile squadron. So with that, I'll try to bring out the use cases with respect to UAS in warfare. Whether we call it drone, RPA, or UAV, which we generally use in loose terms, they're all under a superset of UAS. When you put a drone, the human being, the, all the systems, including communication and backend things, it becomes a system, and that is UAS. But nothing works without network these days. You have to have a network. These drones can be autonomous, pre-planned, AI-enabled, or they can be running. Like FPP drones, we see all the videos of Ukraine happening now. To put my point ahead, I'll first cite two examples. First, from 16 and 2020, between Nagorno and Karabakh, wherein two, we had two sites, which were more, more or less equitable sites. There was no asymmetry in warfare as compared to the basic capability. But one side took the lead, planned it out, included UA systems into their uh, strategy and used them effectively. Uh, they used it with and without network for surveillance, inter intelligence, as well as precision targeting, as well as surprise effects. And they used it very well for propaganda as well as cyber warfare by launching of those videos on the internet, which had a great effect over the world. Overall, they changed the outcome of that war. This is an example of symmetric powers. Now we come to the ongoing war of Ukraine and Russia, which is a great example of asymmetric war. It is a war between David and Goliath. It was said that Russia will roll over with its armored all over Ukraine in a few days and it will be over. But the US part of it has evolved since 2021. It has evolved in various ways and the asymmetries also come out very nicely. Ukraine took the lead in US side, Russia followed, but there was a difference in approach. Russia is more of an uh, organized, bureaucratic government system which is working on this side with large, big systems and a lot of financial power, industrial power behind it. On the other side, Ukraine has given us example of how U UAVs or UAS can be homemade, can be uh, powered by crowdfunding. They have done great job in using commercially available small drones to larger ones which they have procured from other countries. And if we put in now a network, I'll not cite, cite an example from the Air Force of India, but from other countries like Link 16 or small networks like GIG or uh, JTITS uh, as part of this link, you can connect these and the effect and you know, uh, uh, spice it up with a bit of uh, uh, AI, data crunching, data uh, uh, computer capability, and it becomes enormous. The uh, limits, actually it becomes limitless. Overall, what network along with US has done is, it has brought it to our house, all our houses, we are seeing what is happening live. Overall, the battlefield has shrunk. The information is passing on live to everybody. And it's given a new dimension to combined uh, arms warfare. To carry on, I'll just now cover one by one the various uses that US, we are seeing are happening around the world. First and most traditional is the persistent ISR. When I say persistence, what, what I mean is, it's a long-term ISR of the battle space over a large area, wherein you want to see everything that is happening, which has happened earlier, which is happening now, and which is going to happen. You can anticipate that also with good ISR, and that will help the commander. This is because of the multiple sensors that these large UAs uh, carry. For example, MQ-9 Reaper, or uh, Akin, like Chinese Akin C, or Turkish Akin C, or uh, TB2, or uh, CH4, all these are, have been used around the world for carrying out ISR. C 
continuous ISR, they have unlimited, near unlimited capability, we can they stay in air for, uh, air for days together with unmanned systems, there is no limitation of manpower, it is a, uh, the fuel and the cost is much lesser and uh, real time int is available over extended periods. The second use is target acquisition and precision strikes. The first and the second example along with some fire control are basically the traditional examples of what the US has been used around the world and that actually defines how we understand eye in the sky which is the name of this sub summit because we always perceive US usage in these three things that we'll see what is happening, we'll react to it and we'll hit it, these three modes. So under that, using the sensors, we'll see a target, we'll identify it, we'll designate it, engage it with onboard systems or any other subsystem or any other full-fledged system to which the information will be given in the given time and space. That also is being done by precision guided munitions, which itself are guided by UAS. Examples are again, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, TB2, was used very effectively. Uh, Harop, Harop 2 or Harp 2 and Harop were used very effectively. These are loitering munitions. Targets are picked up live and hit by them. There were large SAM systems to so the tune of S300s which were hit by these small systems and hence brought out the, uh, the cost to benefit wherein very expensive systems were hit by very small and uh, not, not so costly uh, systems. So the cost to benefit comes out to the fore. Next is battlefield communication and relay nodes. Again, this has been in Vogue in existence for a very long time. Very old systems, vintaging below, before 2000, are also, have also been used for relaying. Generally, there's a problem of line of sight when a machine is flying from the ground station. This can be done over with if you fly one more UAV which can link up and relay. Uh, example for this are all. All the UAVs generally can be used for this. If they're in a system, they can be used for relay. And using smaller systems, we can make a mesh of connectivity. Then we have EW. Traditionally, large systems have been used by various armies and air forces for carrying out EW, or onboard systems over airborne uh, platforms have been used. But UAV gives a new dimension, very small systems, which can give you penetration without being seen into the enemy territory, and hence increase, and depth, increase the depth of your EW capability. Example here is the Russian Orlan 10. In the initial part of 22, they were used very uh, regularly with a system called Layer 3, where they, were, they have jammed and uh, all the communications because the UAVs used or the systems used by Ukraine were generally open source, generally off the shelf, controlled by using uh, CDMA or other online or open source systems or mobile systems. So these systems, the layer three system on board Orlantan has jammed them nicely. It has also made a great difference in the target um, engaging capability of the enemy of Ukraine. You would have heard a lot about MRLS, uh, MRLS long range rockets of uh, which have been provided by um, USA to Ukraine, but gradually it's not coming in news because GPS jamming has been very effective. That partly has been done by UAS, where the US systems were launched in that area, they jammed the GPS signals, wherein the efficacy of the weapons was not good enough and they didn't get the desired effect and hence they're not making any headlines, apart from the cost factor. A new part which has come up, also seen in Ukraine war, is autonomous uh, logistics and supply. This can be done at two levels. One is uh, how America is going about it or Israel is going about it, that you make a large tactical supply UAS system which can carry hundreds of uh, pounds of load and replace your conventional uh, convoys and vehicles with that wherever possible. The second is in difficult areas to mitigate problems of tactical nature or uh, to save somebody's life, you can drop small, small things or you can feed small troops in the field which are not able to reach, which are fixed at some place, you can solve your problem with logistics um, UAVs. Another example within our own country, very well known to us by virtue of uh, reading papers and seeing the net, is what Pakistan is doing across, that is kind of logistics supply. Small UAVs are dropping weapons, dro dropping drugs as a supply line. So that gives us insight what it can do in war. Unnumerable, innumerable examples can be made out of it. Uh, then we can come on to search and rescue or combat search and rescue. Whenever there's a troop across enemy line who's stuck or a pilot who's down in the enemy area, he needs to be recovered. That's a big boost to our own forces once we recover them. Generally in this, the first is to declare him, find him out where he is and reach him. This part itself makes the whole package very vulnerable to the enemy. And you might land up losing more people than saving one. 
Therefore, in this part, if an unmanned system is used to locate that, at least half or more than half the threat is over. Now you can quickly go in, pick him up and come back. Maybe in future we'll have systems where you can pick the pilot and come back also. Once the size increases, those systems become better. In all this unmanned uh, aerial systems, half the battle is to make a new UAV and use it. The other half is counter the use of it by the enemy. This is a bigger thing for the industry as such. It opens new realm. In the same AOR, it opens a new realm as to how to kill an enemy UAV or a RPA. It can be done kinetically, which is being done kinetically. For example, by ramming. So many videos are there on the internet wherein a Russian or a Ukrainian UAV is going and ramming his UAV into an enemy's uh, drone and taking it down. It can be done by virtue of uh, nets or just by shooting it down with uh, normal bullets, normal machine guns. Apart from that, soft kill options are there, in which our industry is also coming up very nicely. Soft and hard kills together systems are also available with us, uh, wherein either you jam his GPS or you uh, uh, stop the network connection and make him uh, force the system to land. This, this is more possible with commercially available UAVs. But we can also go in an industrial way, like uh, US has uh, made a Phantom Phoenix program. It's a large program or the drone dome of Israel. So it can be done both a large way or a local smaller way with innovation. The next utilization is multi-drone operations. When we put a UAV at the user end or a relay in between with systems on ground under over water, that is maritime use, as well as uh, at on land, that is army use, uh, pull in a bit of cyberspace, pull in a bit of satellite usage, it becomes multi-domain. And the UAS, by virtue of its real-time usage, becomes a big part of the whole system along with the network. Here in what uh, Air Marshal Vikram also said, that now multi-drone operations are unimaginable or are becoming unimaginable without the use of unmanned systems. Another thing we've seen, but it's still under nascent stage, that swarms are being used. You send a lot of drones, they are pre-programmed or they are talking to each other on a network or they're connected to operator on network or their first point of view. Whichever way a swarm is sent, each drone knows what to do. They go in an area. The biggest achievement that they do is they saturate the enemy. He's got too many targets to play with. In between, he starts doing his job. When you put in a bit of AI and computation in it, it becomes much more uh, big than what we can imagine right now. Maybe dangerous. Some of the Hollywood movie already we've seen on these things. That's the future though. Uh, another traditional use is recce and fire support. Very largely used in Nagorno-Karabakh as well as ongoing Ukraine war, wherein small UAVs or bigger UAVs together see a target, pick it up, control their own uh, organic firepower accurately to destroy that target. The help is in terms of surprise, in terms of uh, live, picture, live inputs being given to their own forces. Another possible use, maybe it is happening, I have not found a use, but uh, an example of this, ID detection during a campaign or afterwards, which is more like peacekeeping work, can also be done by UAVs, because it's unmanned, you'll not lose a, a precious life in, life in it. You can have onboard sensors, including uh, terrain, um, penetrating radars, which can pick up, you can have small explosives, and you can either ram into it or uh, take on with the explosive from a distance. One big use of PSYOPs, we all must have seen a video, wherein, We've seen a Russian soldier surrendering to a Ukrainian UAV, a drone. Have you all seen it? Do you think that's a cyber warfare? That video goes on the internet, the whole world believes that Russian soldiers are scared of a drone. That's an example of cyber war. To my, uh, apart from the normal conventional things, drop some leaflets, put a speaker, announce something in their language to make them understand. But if you think this will not have effect to the enemy, I'm sure and the troops on both sides are feeling that they are unsafe even in their own, uh, own um, bunkers. People have been peeping in videos, seeing to peep out, soldiers peeping out, trying to go for, uh, you know, just for nature's call and getting shot in that. So nowhere, the reach is so nicely uh, covered by these UAEs, now it's, it's reaching much beyond what it was imagined earlier. Then another use can be CAP, which is uh, combat air patrol, normally done by fighters with the use of radars. You can have smaller, medium, and large size UAVs, which are integrated into the whole system, which can fly at a time, which can detect incoming uh, threats, give the whole picture. Now, depending on their size and capability, they can be taken on by the unmanned system or by some other system. But it again gives you levels of reach 
the US gives you levels of reach in air defense. Uh, last but not the least is urban warfare. Again, an example I need not speak much. It's been seen enough in Gaza, how Israelis are using micro drones, mini drones, how uh, Russian and Ukrainians are using. Every special force operator now in a team has a drone to see around the corner. He need not have a curved barrel AK. He can actually see, he can even target them with a drone. I've already covered an example of people are being scared of drones. So drones have already achieved what they came for. And the very last which comes to mind is battle damage assessment. You need not send um, a fighter or transport to click photographs and tell you what happened, what was the effect. You need not utilize uh, precious money in maneuvering your satellites to see what has happened. You can small, send very small, you know, few thousand worth uh, drone to click a photograph or stream it live to you. So these are a few examples that I could, uh, you know, bring out to tickle your imagination. But uh, all this to work out, what we need is a connectivity, a net to put them together. Then we add on some cyberspace to have realistic time frames. I enough examples are known. One was covered by the ex-chief of staff also of an example wherein our drone was taken down by the Chinese side and how it was done. With this, connectivity uh, related cyber security issues. I leave it as the last thought for you to dwell on uh, while we have the next speaker. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I thank uh, especially Air Marshal Vatsa uh, on behalf of DSCI to have me here. Uh, having seen the use cases, uh, I try to put it on a AI-generated image here uh, just to show you like what can be the various different use cases and what can be the different threats and how we counter these threats. It's just a uh, image which is generated based on whatever I defend now. Uh, seeing this, uh, what we can actually look into is the threat modeling for a UAS system. And after that, I'll try to cover basically how we embed the AI usage either in the ops side or in the countering ops kind of thing. So basically, when you say threat modeling, in cyber security parlance, there are multiple uh, structures which are available. There is one structure called STRIDE, S-T-R-I-D-E. This is by the Microsoft. And there is a MITRE attack framework, which is also there. Then there is something called cyber kill chain, which is defined by Lockheed Martin. So these are the multiple threat models which are available in the, uh, wherever compliance documents we like to see, like either the NIST document or IEEE documents, you will find these references too. So STRIDE is directly applicable here when we say uh, STRIDE, S-T-R-I-D-E, S yes, represent spoofing, T represent tampering, R ref represent the repudiation. Repudiation is somebody not uh, uh, doing something or altering some system and not owning it. It can be either an insider or an external agency. Then we have I, that is the information disclosure wherein data theft and other things are happening. D is denial of service and E is ele elevation of privileges. These are directly applicable here in uh, this US systems. Uh, direct examples can be seen by the use cases which uh, Abjit has just brought out, like spoofing, like during the Ukrainian conflict, there were reports of spoofing attacks where Russian forces impersonated U Ukraine UAV signals to mislead and disrupt the operations. So directly we have a, uh, this particular uh, vulnerability and the threat which is available. Similarly, in Libya, the drones by various factions were tampered with to change their payload and mission parameters leading to unauthorized attacks. So this has already happened in the past. Same in 
this is tampering when you say in iraq and syria the isis militants were able to intercept the video feeds from uavs and gaining real time intelligence on coalition forces operations this is the information disclosure which we talk about and with respect to d denial of service we have ample examples one of the example we can say is in the conflict of armenian and azerbaijan conflict the ew units were able to jam the uav and cause significant operation delays and mission failures and then when we say e the elevation of privilege in middle east uh, mainly the conflicts which are which we are seeing near yemen and other places there are uavs were hacked on the based on the unpatched software vulnerabilities and allowing the adversaries to take control of the drones and most of the uh, communication related vulnerabilities which abjit brought out is mainly due to the open standards and which is basically the cdma and 3g kind of technology but in that more than 80% of the loopholes are covered the moment you are using 5g chip so there is a need to develop uavs uas systems with 5g uh, in it which will take care of at least in stride the three components are straight away taken care so that that vulnerabilities can be overcome so there is a requirement of 5g chip in any uas being deployed then when we say vulnerabilities we have com communication channel vulnerabilities the same what he had brought up like wireless networks which are prone to eaves dropping jamming and spoofing open communication protocols is the main problem and another main vulnerability is the ground control systems because these are the entry points for cyber attacks most of the times most of the attacks are on these ground control systems which we gain into based on unpatched vulnerabilities or either based on some authentication privilege which is available with very minimal passwords we have seen all over the world this including this ground control system not only for the uav even for the satellite systems everything is vulnerable just because of simple password problem that people had a password which is as simple as which anybody can guess it then comes the physical security when a uav is captured then you are trying to reprogram it reconfigure it, it so that it can be diverted into multiple locations or even tampering for the data theft so basically when we see these kind of things basically even if a uav ca is captured whether there is a self destruction mechanism or whether there is a hard disk or wherever the sd card whichever is there which is encrypted enough so that you don't lose your operational data and another is uh, the environment which matters basically the terrain and weather is the problems so this is when we say stride is one of the threat model and then we have metri's perspective metri what it does is uh, there are mainly the cyber security concerns again it is the open communication standards and the need for robust cyber security threats and then it talks about the system level threats hardware and software vulnerabilities supply chain risks which we have uh, seen from the previous talk in fact i have a paper published on this uh, maybe anybody can google on it supply chain risks in different sector then we have something on the operational threats that is human factors maybe the risk of associated with the operator error or the insider threat then that terrain factors so having seen all these examples and threats and vulnerabilities what are the mitigation strategies mitigation strategies when you say mitigation strategies there are three different phases which we look into design phase operation phase and then we see about continuous monitoring phase so when you say design phase that was emphasized by the uh, uh, air chief marshal badruya sir like design phase is the one which we have to concentrate secure by design integrate security consideration early in the development process like the way which i am telling like we are able to learn from what is happening around the world so we are still in the 
uh, initial stages in most of the places. So probably we can, using these lessons, we can design a better system. Supply chain security is again an important point, point in the design phase. And then comes the operational phase where we talk about authentication and encryption, intrusion detection systems which we can be deployed so that even when a, somebody, uh, some uh, spurious signal or something can be there, yeah, malicious UV gets part of your system, you will be able to detect it. Then we have physical security measures, which I already told you that even if you lose it, you are able to get back. Uh, you're, you don't lose the data or you don't lo lose the plan for it. And last, uh, so the third one is the continuous monitoring and updates, wherein we are talking about the software patching and uh, uh, those kind of things. Then incident response, how good are we at incidents? Any incident noted, how well our system is to respond to that incident post that particular event has happened. Having seen these uh, mitigation strategies, I'll just uh, cover very fastly on the AI part in the US separating system. Mainly when we say AI, it has a major role in adaptive communication that is based on whichever signals are getting jammed, you are able to change over the channels and you're able to switch systems. Then we have the encryption and cyber security embedded in it so that the encryption system also is able to work on it accordingly. A driven mission planning, when you have fusion of multiple data, multiple situational awareness picture to you, then there is a A driven mission planning requirement. And dynamic resource allotment and management based on the data that particular time, real time, you are able to dynamically change and allocate. Next, coming to the, having seen the supporting part of the AI, we'll see the countering US, how you counter the US in that the AI part, the mainly the radar and sensors, the improved detection capabilities, EW, again for the jamming and the adaptive EW tactics, cyber and kinetic operation where we enter into the domain of SEMA and electromagnetic attacks. So basically, uh, I just gave a broad details with respect to the threat modeling, the vulnerabilities, and the mitigation as well as the AI in this sphere. The moment we say AI, definitely the adversary capability can be always uh, detected based on some pattern recognition and other things. So basically, these threat models are available so we have to look into each and every uh, th vulnerability threat and see the risk. And it's not necessary that we act on every risk unless it has having impact. That you might have a bigger risk, but we might not act. We have to act only when the impact is there. Because in the previous session, we talked about impact factors. Unless the impact is more than two, we need to act for it. So with that, I conclude. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank DSCI for having given me this podium to share my views and uh, to be a part of this uh, esteemed audience and panelists. I am Vandana Iyer, Additional General Manager, Bharat Electronics Limited. Uh, BL is known for its radars and sonars and uh, uh, a few years back, we have diversified into unmanned systems, and I happen to be the vertical head of this group. Now, unmanned systems means we have an aerial domain, we have an underwater domain, we have surface of water, and we have ground. But today, I would re restrict myself to the UAVs. So, from the industry point of view, uh, having seen so many um, leads, how, uh, so many RFPs, RFIs, interacted with so many customers and uh, uh, seeing the GEM portal, seeing so many startups, MSMEs. Now we have got a fair idea where we stand. So while all my predecessors have given a very uh, broad uh, overview and uh, a very global scenario of the UAVs, I would probably drill down and go to the grassroots level. 
So when we take a drone, um, which is a very common uh, uh, activity now, nobody has any fear of drones, whether it is a school-going kid or an elderly person, everybody seems to be knowing everything about drones. But then uh, the kind of problems which we face while complying and uh, uh, trying to be, you know, having an indigenous content of more than 50%. So just I would like to share some of the challenges and some, I would like to sensitize you. So uh, when we talk of the drone, we first look at the airframe. So when we take, uh, take the airframe, we, we naturally look at the composite manufacturing facility in the country. Now, while we have very good established processes for the male and the hail UAVs, that is the medium altitude long endurance and the high altitude long endurance UAVs, which are more than 150 kg in the class. Uh, when we look at the smaller drones, which seem to proliferate around uh, all the air spaces and everybody, anybody and everybody seems to be making it. So there are no rules to the game for the smaller UAVs, unfortunately. So, there are a number of people in Bangalore who are manufacturing the airframes. If you give the design to them, they will immediately make it. But uh, there is this fear of vulnerabilities entering into these things because there are, these processes are not certified. Not for all. Uh, for most of them, the processes uh, for small vendors are not certified. On one hand, it is our responsibility to bring them up, but we also have to take care of the quality. Now, Going more inside the drone, if we look at the autopilot or the flight controller. Now, in order to become L1, everybody is using the neighbor's autopilot. And the software is an open source software. Now, the indigenous content added to it is because we are all, uh, all Indians, we are all expert at software, we try to tweak it here and there and say we have, we have our own software, that is our value addition. So that is the ground reality for the flight controller, but it is full of vulnerabilities. Now, coming to the third point, when we look at the propulsion system, when we see the propulsion system, the motors, the ESCs, propellers, everything is from, again, from our neighbors. Now, two years back, we have started indigenizing the motors, but otherwise, uh, we do not have a very good uh, uh, supply chain for the motors, an indigenous source, I mean to say that. Um, now, companies like BEL, uh, we are under the MOD and we are, we have, as I need not explain about BEL, but we do not uh, buy from such sources. We are very clear about it, that we have to give a very quality, uh, a quality and a reliable product. So in that process, we buy from European sources or American sources, and our cost for the uh, motors or the batteries is almost 20 times. The autopilot is also almost 20 times. Now, when we submit the proposal, uh, obviously, supposing uh, we have to say we have to provide a surveillance drone, maybe for the Kumbh Mela. In January, it has to see through the fog. Now, our camera itself will be 30 lakhs, whereas the size of the drone will be very small. So, it gets compared with the DJI. Why can't you give it in 5 lakhs? Somebody will ask us. It becomes very difficult to explain because the... Uh, so, it's, it's not about L1 alone. I feel that... Uh, we need to uh, widen our perspective, look at the performance parameters. Not only do we take, compare the, if not, not only should we benchmark the price or the specs, we should also see the performance parameters in depth before accepting any drone. Now, coming to the uh, navigation and the communication. Uh, right now, most of the drones are uh, aided by GPS, but we must now try to uh, include more of IRNSS and those kind of receivers we should try to include so that we can use our own NAVIC. And um, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the communication, uh, in the, for the data link also we are using all imported ones only. Right now we do not have. And uh, so uh, there is a, uh, once somebody said that we can have a mesh network especially for the beyond line of sight communication where we need this ATCOM solution. 
we need to have a mesh network but in the with on the area of operation however that mesh network uh, may not always uh, suffice so uh, now in the latest uh, trend what is going on is that the uh, lower earth orbit satellites are being proposed the leo satellites uh, and uh, i think three companies in india are getting the license one is this uh, starlink and airtel and jio so airtel is uh, part of oneweb and starlink is from uh, spacex and uh, geo from reliance so any time these licenses will be given once this is given then we will see more of uav traffic also so it is just a matter of time now but uh, once again um, uh, whatever it is our information is going to again the foreign satellites so it is very very important for india that we launch our own satellites and have dedicated satellites for the uav communication uh, it is then only we will become truly atmanirbhar and um, uh, coming to the testing part of it uh, when we uh, when we go to the uh, when we decide to test our uavs uh, the whole place is crowded so we have very few aeronautical test ranges in india and uh, now if you look at startups msmes etc nobody can afford those and moreover uh, th those are uh, currently occupied by most of the currently running drdo projects or the large projects so generally what the people are doing is they are testing the uavs in some open fields open areas trying to fly up to 20 meters 30 meters they are not going beyond that because it is a red zone so if they get caught it will be a problem so we don't have any facilities for testing and we whatever pilot license we get from the uh, dgca approved pilot schools they are only for the quadcopters for the fixed wing aircrafts we still don't have any mechanism of getting licenses so this is one more area where we need to focus on so uh, and finally i feel uh, semilac takes care of all the large uavs and uh, whatever are the uh, defense uavs that is under control but the non defense applications where civ civilian drones are there uh, i think there is no body or there is no committee which is uh, setting the guidelines very clearly and that is why it is expanding in a very uncontrolled way so I think this is one area where uh, really we need to look at before it is too late. And uh, last but not the least, I would like to draw your attention to the forensic aspect. Now, drone forensics is an important subject. And uh, because tomorrow, if any drone comes and falls in our organization's premises, first of all, we should know what to do and how to go about the whole thing. Otherwise, our chief security officer will also not, he will be blinking. He will not know what action to take. So we need to have clear guidelines. So the, uh, there is a need for opening some center of excellence throughout the country for these uh, drones. So that uh, clear guideline is there, SOP is there, how to deal with it and how to report this incident. And uh, of course, there are, uh, uh, there are many uh, ways of carrying out the drone forensics. That is a separate subject uh, due to, I think time is up for me. My, <laughs> my previous speakers, I think, have not left much time for me. <laughs> so I'm not complaining, but I, I have to, <laughs> I have to <laughs> adhere. <laughs> so that is the reason I am winding up quickly. <laughs> I, I try to share maximum in the eight minutes what I got. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you. Thank you. So I'll just do a roundup. <clears throat> so we first heard all the use cases and gave us some very nice examples and very insightful examples from all the wars that have been taking place from Armenia to uh, Ukraine and to the Middle East. And uh, he also emphasized on what kind of roles were being used and how simple, cheap UAVs are doing you know, so much damage. Uh, you must have seen uh, these pictures where you know, cardboard UAVs, UAVs just made from cardboard, are used to carry grenades and they drop it down the hatch of a tank. So now all tanks have a, like a chicken cage on top so that, you know, the grenades don't come in. So it's a, it's a cheap, uh, let's say, solution for a, for a cheap weapon. So um, he also explained what is a hard kill, what is a soft kill, 
Now, because UAVs are getting more and uh, more sophisticated, they are being weaponized more. In the olden days, UAVs were mainly suicide drones, where the UAV itself uh, would be destroyed. But now, uh, with the kind of UAV like the Reaper and the CH2 and the Winglung, uh, etc., they are capable of uh, carrying weapons up to 110 kg size, and which can do a lot of damage with a lot of precision. So this is a whole new threat. And the most important is, of course, the swarms. Even if the swarm itself is not armed or weaponized, just its ability to put 150 new tracks on a radar can overwhelm any air defense system, no matter how uh, um, you know, clever uh, that system is. Because any controller sees 150 aircraft coming is, uh, is going to get confused. Uh, then we heard from Ruben, and I think he gave us a very nice uh, yeah, insight into how threat modeling is done, both from the West and uh, also from Europe. Uh, I think the most important thing he said was that 5G is really the baseline now. Uh, or if, if you don't have 5G, uh, your UAV is going to get hijacked and it's uh, you know, going to be taken away. And he also brought out the fact that the maximum vulnerabilities are with the ground stations, not only in uh, terms of cyber security, but in terms of physical security. Just people leaving their doors open or leaving the computers on, that is the maximum threat. He also um, you know, brought out mitigation uh, of all this. And uh, once again, it was you know, brought out like the earlier speakers that uh, the management of uh, the supply chain will be the biggest, the biggest issue you know, during war, especially as our last speaker spoke that most of our parts uh, come from China. Not only do they come from, uh, let's say, foreign countries, they come from China. And uh, this is going to be uh, you know, the maximum threat. Our last speaker, um, of course, brought out the rules of the game. Uh, the procedures are not certified, and uh, how to bring L1 costs down. People are uh, using equipment uh, you know, from China. I would like to disagree. About a few years ago, in 2016, I authored the uh, CAR Part 1, which was the Civil Air Regulations, uh, brought out by DGCA, for the control and regulation of UAVs in India. So this was for UAVs below 400 feet and above 250 grams. We have also now authored uh, the regulatory controls for beyond visual line of sight. We are the first country in the whole world, in the whole, in the whole of ICAO, who has brought out these rules where beyond visual line of uh, you know, sight UAVs, which will essentially fly like a real aircraft, uh, except the fact that it won't be manned, so those rules have been brought out and procedures to certify them. We have sat with Semilec and procedures to, uh, to certify them, which is something completely new that uh, has never been done in this country, has also been done. So yes, the main threat is uh, all the Shadiwala drones, as you, you know, call them. Each child has a drone that he can fly uh, up to 200 feet. But um, so controlling them has... Um, has been a difficult task and I think at the end of the day the government has finally given up and they've said that anything below 250 grams and below 200 feet is on its own. We don't uh, you know, want to regulate that. But anything beyond that will need some rules. You'll, uh, like she said, you'll need to have a license, you'll need to know English, you'll need to be able to speak to the uh, you know, air traffic control of the nearest airport. You can't operate within five kilometers of an airport, blah, blah, blah. So all this, uh, just before the chaos you know, sets in, as she said, uh, has been regulated. So once again, thank you all. I think very uh, interesting talks.